looking solid. Okay, awesome. So, uh, John, thank you so much for taking the video call. I know you had nothing going on this Monday morning. You felt like being on the internet, right? Um, uh, thank you to you and to your uh, lovely wife, your assistant there. Um, so uh, you have, it's, and I want to look at you because you're awesome and you're amazing and in shape, but I can't help but look behind you at this amazing rig. Yes, this amazing rig that you've set up um, and everything that you put together. So um, I want to, ultimately, I want to get to talking about that, but, you know, sort of macro level wise, um, I think there's a journey. When people make an epic bike, there's a story behind that epic bike, right? Like if people don't just go out and buy epic bikes. I mean, some people do, but nobody likes to talk to those people. They're crazy. Um, and usually maybe jerky or something like that. Your story is somewhat different. Uh, you've always been pushing the envelope. So could you kind of tell people at home who maybe have not heard of you before, sort of how you got to the point where you said, I'm going to build this ultimate rig? Sure. Um, I did my first triathlon in 2010. It was a sprint. I did it on a road bike. Yep. Um, joined EN that summer. Um, bought my first tri bike, which is a Cervelo P3. Okay. My first Ironman the next year, 2011, on, on that bike. Mm -hmm. Then I stepped up to the P5, which just got released right after that. So um, I was probably one of the first people to get a P5. And I had that. Oh, there's the bike right there. Uh -huh. Um, and I've had that bike now for seven plus years, over 15,000 miles on it. So, you know, when I look at, you know, bikes are super expensive, but when I look at a cost per mile, that thing was less than 50 cents per mile for one. <laughs> so right. when I, I compare it to a pair of say Vaporfly uh, shoes, it's a lot cheaper than that. So that's how I justify the, uh, the big spend on that. So right. I've now done 10 Ironmans, okay. seven of, uh, no, eight of them were on that P5. Mm -hmm. And um, it, you know, over seven years and that many miles and that much use on a bike, it starts to show, it, show its wear. So that thing has original 10-speed DI2 uh, components, which aren't even supported anymore. So anytime right. something would go or almost go wrong on it, I would, I would get nervous because you can't even buy parts for it anymore. Right. And, also, it was one of the original builds right off of, you know, the, the first ones off the line. And the rear triangle has gotten a little bit flexy over the years. And mm -hmm. as you can see, I'm not a small guy. I raced at about 180 pounds. Right. I was 230 before I started doing Ironman stuff. I was a former wrestler. So clearly my, my build isn't like the, the skinny little guys. Right. So I, I need a bike that can take a lot of force and take a lot of twisting and things like that. And, and mm -hmm. I was seeing over the years that uh that bike started to wear a little bit on that okay so last year into into ironman wisconsin a couple of times during training one time it rained really hard and all of my you know my my derailleurs all basically shorted out all and right was like, uh oh it was two weeks before my big iron man mm -hmm. and my bike literally didn't work and i was trying to figure out okay am i gonna have to solve this problem last second right luckily i got everything to dry out it was like sticking your iphone in a bag of rice i basically <laughs> put bags of rice around all of my components. Oh. They dried out and then I just prayed for, for nice weather during the race and thankfully it did rain and I lived through it. But, oh man. Um, you know, I basically had decided going into that, if I survive through this thing, my bike makes it, the whole time when I was on the bike, I was just thinking, just get me to the, you know, 112 miles and I lasted the whole thing and started right. my race. It's great. Um, but then I was kind of like, all right, I want to have a fresh start. I want something new. Mm -hmm. uh, doing Kona this year, so it was kind of my, you know, present to myself to have a new bike and a new start and a new thing, and, mm -hmm. and that's where this whole process started. I see. Okay, wow, that's that's epic, and I do appreciate. Right, so you know, one of the things that I think sometimes gets missed, um, and the way that you do it as well, you know, buying that bike, really spending the time, putting your energy into it, and then and then using that thing. Right, you're not. Um, I think sometimes people are unattached to the items that are on their bike or to their bike itself because they're not really that involved with it. Whereas you, on the other hand, I mean, I remember when you were custom doing the the electronic shifting on your P5, right? You had to hack yeah. that. I was one of the first people to put the bullhorn uh, shifters. I put cat eye buttons in. I have had to replace them about three times on there. I do all my training on my tri bike. You know, I have a road bike, but I don't use it very often. Mm -hmm. uh, climbing on there, if it rains, I you know, I, I, I use that thing year round mm -hmm. on my trainer he's on the rollers uh so so yeah i'm intimately involved with it and and part of my process for preparing for a race is right. cleaning the thing up making it spotless 
not just for dirt, but for having a perfectly clean dry train and mm -hmm. having it when, you know, all of anything that could break up wind gets, gets removed off the bike. And it's, uh, I want to be as fast as I could possibly be given my limit ability of my legs. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't want my gear slowing me down. Okay. All right. Awesome. So, uh, before we dive into the specifics now, I know you were asking me questions about, uh, the Ventum frame itself, which I'm familiar with. Um, but you kind of went one step further and we're starting to look at how to sort of next level your bike, which makes sense, right? If it's a seven year investment, you're saying, Hey, I want to get ahead of the curve now and, and then be able to kind of roll with it, I guess, for the next couple of years versus installing best in class now, and then having everything evolve over the next five years. So what were some of those key elements that you were looking to do on the new ride? All right. So I, you know, Jess is holding the camera right now, so she, I can say this and she, I see her laughing at me, but when, when I mentioned that I wanted a new bike, right. she was like hundred percent supportive. She's like, get the exact bike you want. Don't get something you're not going to be happy with. Right. Uh, she's how much time I spend on that thing. And she kind of jokes that I love, love my bikes more than her, which is absolutely not true. But, ah. um, uh. but so I wanted to build this thing exactly how I wanted it. And right. the first thing I wanted was the right bike. I, I was kind of brand agnostic. I didn't really care what bike I wanted, but I had a lot of things that, that needed to fit. So it, it had to have a perfect fit. And that was super important to me. I mean, part of the, the thing of being fast on a bike is having the right fit, not having the right frame. Right. Um, so right fit was important. I wanted it to have a really st stiff kind of rear triangle and, and bottom bracket area because of, you know, the things I started to get frustrated with with, with my old bike. Um, yeah, I wanted it to not be super heavy. My P5 is a heavy bike. I mm -hmm. wanted it to be lighter than that. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted it to look super cool, you know, Ideally, it matches my EN kit because I know that's on the There you go. <laughs> All of those things kind of built into this. And mm -hmm. so I started asking lots of, you know, you know, we have the whole benefit of a big community. I put up a thread. I ask people, you know, to give me ideas kind of in anything right. build goes. That, and I went through a lot of different bikes. I looked at a lot of different ones. Uh, and ultimately, I was sat. I had kind of a top five that I had narrowed it down to. Okay. Um, and then I sat down with my fitter, this guy, Chris Balzer, in, mm -hmm. in Minneapolis, one of the best fitters probably in the world. And we sat down literally for three hours just talking about bikes. We'd pull up a bike, pull up the geometry. He had already mapped out my bike, mapped out my geometry. Okay. And we went through whether it would work for me, whether it wouldn't work for me, the pros and cons of a certain bike, not just the fit, but the cool factor and the reliability. And, yep. and one after one, we started kind of crossing bikes off, so to speak. Oh, okay. yeah. And the ultimate winner was was the Ventum, and part of that was you know we have a really good partnership with En and Ventum. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things I was worried about was simply the stiffness of it, uh, right. the weight of it. Uh, luckily, you know I know you've raced yours really successfully, so I was mm -hmm. able to you know have conversations with you. I talked to Jerry Beeler, some of the really right. fast guys that are bigger guys as well, people that I really respect. Um, you know, and your comments about this bike being stiff and really carrying power and, and transferring all that power to into speed was, was mm -hmm. super important. So mm -hmm. uh, all of those things combined, I, I decided to go to Venom, but then I took it the next step further. So my, my thread that I put up on the end has 30 different comments on it. So people posting on, okay, now that I'm going to go with the Ventum, how do I lean it out a little bit? How do I, and I went through all kind of iterations about building mm -hmm. this, you know, ultra expensive, super carbon, this and that, to try to make a super light, you know, the world's lightest Ventum, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and I was I was willing to make those investments and make that purchase, but ultimately that didn't end up being what I built. I built what, you know, ended up being a, a somewhat standard build with a few exceptions. One, I wanted a one-by. Okay. Um, and most people that I mentioned to at the beginning, they're like, you're an idiot. There's... <laughs> You know, everybody rides a two by. You get all the gear range you want. Everybody right. is like, why would you want a one by? Uh, and you know, on my P5, my chain dropped almost every time I was out. Right. You know, part of that was the how old the drivetrain was. Maybe you know, I was using the oblong chain rings. There's all kind of things, but I've never dropped my chain on my fat bike, which is a one by. Never mm -hmm. dropped my chain on my mountain bike, which is a one by. I kind of think that's where things are going. And now with the big cassettes, you can get the full gear range. You know, I used to I used a uh, 5236 equivalent uh, crank set mm -hmm. and 1128 
pretty much year round, no matter what course, no matter what I was doing, because I didn't mind the cadence gap so much. And when I looked at the, you know, being a dorky engineer, but with mm-hmm. spreadsheet, with a 52 tooth chain ring in the front and an 1140 in the back, so basically a mountain bike cassette, mm-hmm. You get the same gear range as you do in a two by, but now I've cleaned it up. I've got no big gear area hanging off the front grabbing wind. Mm-hmm. Um, one less thing to cause a chain drop. And it's kind of cool. Like nobody has one and that's right. You know, let's, if you're building anything you want, it's kind of fun to have something that nobody else has. Right. Right. Well, I appreciate the, uh, the process of kind of working through like your idea. Um, I do want to just highlight for people who are watching at home, like, you know, John kind of had an idea. He was talking anecdotally, but he also went to a respected fitter and then worked and eliminated things off the list. That's, that's classic John, uh, but it's, that's classic how you should be thinking about this whole process, right? Don't just let it be that, uh, you know, sort of that gut reaction or that visceral thought like this bike looks so cool, but really, you know, what is going to be the best bike for me? And when you're going big like this, you want to hit it out. I mean, we're fortunate that the Ventum is, is really, um, really customizable in terms of fit. Um, and I think, you know, um, again, you mentioned the partnership, but, uh, I think ultimately their customer service in terms of dialing in that bike on the front end is massive. Can you speak a little bit about how you, when you were talking with our partners at Ventum about how you went through that process? I mean, I know Rachel, I love Rachel. How did you go through that process there? Yeah. So Mariah originally booked me up with Rachel and I spoke with her before I ever decided to go with Ventum. I asked her a bunch of questions, partly over email. She was actually at Kona at the time okay. and apologized. She said, I'm, I'm in between flights, but I have a half hour layover and you want to talk right now. Okay. And I'm like, oh, slow down. I have <laughs> a year before I need to race. Right. Um, and it, she like, got back to me right away. Mm-hmm. We got on the phone. I told her the things I wanted. I told her what I was looking to build. Uh, she pinged her engineers and some of her designers. And we went back and forth with a bunch of emails, a bunch of questions I have. Mm-hmm. And then conversations with my fitter and her guys back and forth on what exact size I should get, dimensions on the cockpit, a few mm-hmm. things that, that I really wanted. Um, you know, and I learned pretty early on that the standard cockpit, which is all integrated and super cool on, on the normal Ventum, mm-hmm. isn't wide enough for me. My fitter wanted me to have really wide bars. Obviously, I'm not yeah. a brawny guy. So that kind of sent me right to the frame set, which was fine because in a one by you kind of have to build all your components anyways. So okay. uh, a complete bike wasn't going to work for exactly what I wanted. Right. Um, but that was kind of helpful to, to figure out exactly what size, figure out the dimensions, figure out what I, I can and can't do. Mm-hmm. And then that brought me to, okay, now I have this frame set. Once I bought it, I mean, it was at my house within three days, I think. Yeah. Um, and then there was the process of, oh, I unboxed this great box, this great frame set. What am I going to put on this thing? And that, that created this process of, of the, kind of standard build uh, okay. you know first place i worked with is my cockpit because i needed something wide i needed something adjustable and just like we have a partnership with with ventum my fitter actually has a really good relationship with the guys at zip okay. so he helped he'd been working with them on their new uh you know their new cockpit mm-hmm. and how adjustable it is and exactly what it works for me it's nice and stiff it's arrow so that actually worked out really well for me to put that on this bike. Okay. Then I went around trying to figure out, okay, what crank set, what pedals, what mm-hmm. you know, components. Um, I ended up with all ETAP stuff. Okay. Um, it was a little easier to do the one by setup. Uh, you know, back to the EN, EN um, help and people that helped me on my original thread, Robin Sarner reached out to me and said, hey, I have a one by by dry bike. And I said, <laughs> oh, this is great. Can you send me pictures? And literally he sent me, you know, more than a dozen pictures of different stuff, different parts of his build, okay. giving advice on, you know, on the rear derailleur, if you add a wolf, wolf tooth chain link, that puts the derailleur a little bit far away from the uh, the frame set, and that allows you to take a bigger cassette than what they said. Mm. So little tweaks like that, you're not supposed to be able to run a 40 tooth cassette on a normal road, you know, wide fly derailleur, but mm. when you put that road link in, you can get that extra range. Okay. So things like that i'm like oh this really might work and that's you know one of the uh, along the, the process of along the way to find out exactly what i want that was super helpful for me. okay that's awesome i think it's cool for people to know like you know ventum has that awesome bike builder on their website but that's not just a gimmick like behind the scenes they've got the staff and that sort of customer service um institutionalized where you can talk to anybody and get it all dialed in so and for those of you geeking out at home we have a full list 
I ask anything of Rachel and she, and I'm like, uh oh, here we go again. I'm sending her a long email right. and she forwards it to her engineers and then they send me back and it was, it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. When you kind of get the, the mind meld between like, you know, what you're looking for and what they want. I'm sure that they're constantly frustrated by customers who are just drive-bys or, or don't know what they really want or aren't that specific, you know, in your case, um, and what we're going to see here in a second, the final build is going to be epic. And I know they're just as proud of it as you are, you know? Um, so uh, I was just going to say for the geeks at home, we do have, and I'll put it in the video notes and the blog post, the, all the list of all the specs, everything that John has on his bike. So you can see it. Um, but why don't we turn our attention over here now to the rig and we can talk a little bit about that. I don't know. I don't know where you want to start. Like I have this list and I don't know what is the coolest part. So where do you want to go? Uh, the coolest part is my stem cap. Okay. I don't know if Jess can zoom in on that. Oh, look at that. Endurance so, Nation in the house. Custom EN stem cap, which is super important. Yes. Um, second thing, when I built one by, when you pull the, the front derailleur off of here, there's a space for the derailleur hanger. So I had a buddy of mine who actually works for Mission Boats. He actually owns the company. And okay. he was over and said, I need to fill this thing in. So he brought his computer over and we designed up, or he did most of the work a piece to fill that. Now, again, and talking annoying people, we went through about four iterations, mm -hmm. but now I have a cool thing that where the derailleur used to be that just shows that, hey, there's no derailleur here. Mm -hmm. um, I went with a cork. My fitter wanted me to have uh, shorter cranks. So these are 162 and a half, and I'm six foot one. So going shorter allowed me to have a, a more kind of lean forward mm -hmm. uh, view on this thing. Right. Um, Seat angle was about 82 and a half degrees. So I've gotten probably three degrees further forward than I was able to get on my P5. Now, that doesn't sound like my, that opens up my hip angle. And I'm trying, to, <laughs> I'm trying to have my glutes be fired more instead of wearing out my quads. And that was important. We're talking to my fitter. So this bike allowed me to do that where I couldn't do that on my old P5. Hey, hey John, just hold a second. Jess, will you stop zooming in on his glutes? That's just not appropriate <laughs> for this podcast. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so if you look back here, this is, you know, this is an ETAP Wi-Fi derailleur. Mm -hmm. um, I put Kogel ceramic bearings on here with, on the jockey wheels, mostly because they're red and I wanted it to match the bike. Yes. Important. Um, you can see this giant cassette on here. So that's an 1140 XTR cassette. Mm -hmm. And this little piece here is the road link. So normally the derailleur would mount right here, but instead this is stretched down. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, and I put this cool red tape on the top here for, in case I have chain slap, that'll protect the, uh, the carbon, but also because it's red and it looks cool. Yeah. Uh, went with look carbon pedals. So when I, when I went with these pedals and the cork, that was actually lighter than going with a super light, like a lightning all carbon crank and okay. using my one uh, pedal power meter. So I, okay. I moved to that. Okay. Um, if we move up to the cockpit, so this is the brand new zip cockpit mm -hmm. and it's actually made this nose cone will hold the blip box for the new 12 speed, uh, e tap that they have. Okay. But I have 11 speed on here and for a whole nother podcast, the 12 speed doesn't work for me, or at least it doesn't work for me yet. Mm -hmm. And the blip box on the 11 speed is much bigger. One of the things that a lot of people kind of complain about or don't like. So me being me, I got out my trusty Dremel mm -hmm. and I went and took this nose cone off and I Dremeled out the inside of it. Okay. And then I cut the, uh, the garment attachment off the back of my blip box and took my belt sander to the blip box and I sanded that all down. Okay. And I was able to get the 11 speed blip box to fit up inside this nose cone. And it, it's actually super clean when you do it that way. Wow, look at that, yeah that and I got the buttons you know bullhorn shifters because I'm really used to having that there mm -hmm. um, I needed a way to hold my Garmin so I took an old set of carbon uh, extensions mm -hmm. and just cut a piece there and ground out the corner so that would fit in there to hold my Garmin on top of there okay and these, these new the uh, zip extensions they have a nice kind of rough grip on yeah, them I see so that no bar tape on them and it's actually super comfortable when I'm riding it. Mm -hmm. And then with the clicks on the top to be able to shift with. Okay. That's so okay. these bars, the thing that's different about my fit now is they angle up where my P5 didn't angle up. These angle up a little bit 
Mm -hmm. They get a lot further. And again, this whole thing pushes my body forward. I'm a lot further forward on this bike than I was on my P5, even though the front end's a little higher than, uh, than my front end used to be. Mm -hmm. So that's, I don't know. That's most of the, uh, most of the stuff. Okay. What's in a ton lighter than my, my P5 was. So All right. I'm happy with that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not, the lightest bike in the world, but it's not the heaviest either. And my size, that doesn't really matter anymore. So. Right. Yeah. So, I can't believe like, just, I mean, just, um, hearing you talk about the fit side of things, I can't believe you got three extra degrees, uh, on the front end. That's um, massive. That's massive. Part of, part of it's the way that their seat post works. This is the same. So the only things that are from my old bike are the saddle, in the wheels okay um, but their seat post is set up a lot better that you can get the seat really far forward even with the same saddle that i had mm -hmm. and with the shorter cranks that means i can take my seat higher and that means i can rotate everything forward a bit right um so that that worked out great for me okay wow that's epic um so uh first ride experience you swung your leg over when was the first ride we still have we have a date like an anniversary date uh, I don't know the date. I don't remember the date in my head, but I, it, you know, we have two feet of snow still here in Minnesota. So I've only been on Zwift. Okay. Um, and the first time I got on it, I was like, oh, this is awesome. You know, when I'm in my air bars on my P5, it, it's super aggressive and it, I can feel it. When I went down in this thing, I'm like, wow, this is, this is great. It's really comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to tell, you know, really getting force transfer when you're on rollers versus right. outside, but it's, it felt super comfortable. It's been great. I've been on it ever since, and I haven't had a single, a single problem with it. So wow. that's epic. I'm, I mean, I'm just, I'm super pumped. Like just to go through this whole process with you from, from idea. Cause we were talking about it before Kona. Uh, that's when I was picking your brain about the vapor flies and you were like, just do it, which I'm so <laughs> grateful for. Um, uh, to, to see the finished bike now is epic. So that whole timeline for you, like, from like, let's just say from like order of frame, you know, finally after the back and forth to what we're standing in front of now, like how long was that whole build process? It took me about four months. Okay. Um, but I wasn't in a hurry. I don't mm -hmm. race till October. I had another bike to ride on my roller. So right. it was like, I wasn't in that big a hurry, but mm -hmm. you know, it's a process to pick out every, just figuring out the right bottom bracket for this bike. Yeah. Order one. It wasn't what I wanted, sent it back, ordered another one. Mm -hmm. You know, I got the wrong size length of cable on my blips. Okay. I got another set. You know, just getting things in piece by piece by piece. The fit process took a lot longer because I had to first, you know, you first have to get it kind of almost right and mm -hmm. then go into the fitter and get the bars where it needs to be. And then I had to figure out, okay, well, now I need to order the right stem. And okay. that takes another week or two. And then you get the stem and the bars built and you go back to the fitter mm -hmm. and it's kind of, you know, the steer tube. And it was a constant iteration of me doing some things, mm -hmm. getting a mechanic to help me out with a few things, going to the back of the fitter and kind right. of iterating around on that. But since I wasn't in a hurry, it was no big deal. Could I, I have done it a month or two? Maybe. Okay. Um, but it just kept coming together a little bit over time and it was mm -hmm. kind of neat to watch that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you, uh, it strikes me that since you're so detailed and in love with your bikes, I bet you have some really good, uh, tips for taking care of your bikes. If you had like two or three tips for people at home who have a nice bike, who should be taking care of it, what do you do to keep that thing, you know, beautiful and running seven years? Um, I clean it with green fizz. Okay. So, uh, that green fizz and a little bit in a paper towel. And oh. that's how I, all my bikes all the time. So that, that's okay. important. Uh, keeping the drivetrain clean. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time keeping in when you're only inside, it's not as big a deal. Mm -hmm. When you go outside, keeping that chain clean. So I have a lot of rags that I'll just run the chain, you know, mm -hmm. while I'm holding the rag. Right. Uh, if I oil my chain, I spend three times as long running my chain through the rag after I've oiled it than before. So mm -hmm. I first get all the stuff off, then I oil it. And then it's getting all that oil back off so it okay. doesn't collect afterwards. Right. Uh, but that's about it. Ride okay. them. Ride them a lot. Ride, just ride, just ride it. Um, just are you excited? It. Now, the E-Tap, you know, on my road bike, the E-Tap shifting is different than my DI2. Is it the same for you now? Uh, 
it's a little different, especially with a one by, because it doesn't really matter. I, everything on the right side shifts it to the right, okay. and the left side shifts it to the left. So that's okay. all I have. Right. Here. There's there's no double clicking to get the big ring to shift because there's no big ring. There's no big ring, right? It's the simplest system ever. If I you know push one of these, it shifts. Push the other one, it shifts the other way. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize on a two by, even though you've got 22 gears. You don't even use four or five of them mm -hmm. with cross chaining, and there's some that are similar ratios. Right. So you actually don't lose many gears at all with one by eleven, and a one by twelve will be even closer. Mm -hmm. uh, you have constant cadence gap, cadence gaps, and no overlaps. You don't have to figure out am I supposed to upshift or downshift the front, and you know also shift the back. It's just smooth out and back the whole way. So mm -hmm. it's a lot. Wow, that is a lot. All right, so last bit here, I want to let you go in a second, but so you mentioned riding a lot on Zwift. You, can you walk us through your Zwift setup real fast? People would love to see it in real life. Sure. I've, I've got what I think is the coolest Zwift setup in the whole world. So this room that we're standing in used to be a golf simulator. So we bought the house, I guess. The people we bought it from were, were big golfers. Okay. And I turned it into a bike room. So clean it up for this, but normally there's tools and stuff everywhere. <laughs> um, you know, we got our mountain bikes here. And so down there is where you used to do the, you used to be able to swing and hit golf balls and do different courses. Okay. And Jeff was like, you don't play golf, why don't you turn that into your Zwift room? So I'm like, oh, that's great. Put rubber matting down, put my rollers in the bottom, and I have a 180 inch kind of full size Zwift screen, which you can see back there right now. Wow. So when I'm riding on there, it's, it's kind of real life sized people that I'm riding with. Uh, you know, the rollers make it a really good feel. At the beginning, I had to, you know, I had to learn. You see there's blue tape on the floor there. I had to learn when you're going through some of the S's on Zwift. A couple of times I fell off. I literally fell onto the floor because my mind wanted to yes. turn, turn. And instead, my bike did what it wasn't wow. supposed to. Wow. So I put this here that I can actually reach out and grab it if I need to. And I've learned at certain spots on Zwift, I just look down at the blue tape and my fan. And that keeps me straight and keeps me going. Okay. Oh, man. I never thought about that, how realistic it would be. You would just ride off your rollers. <laughs> it's really crazy because it's hard enough to ride on rollers anyways. Yes. And, you know, when you're in Zwift, it kind of puts you into it. So you have to disconnect your mind from what you, your visual, all your visual senses are telling you. Right. And the opposite to actually just stay upright and vertical on, on right. rollers. You're not connected to anything. Wow. Wow. And so you got your keyboard next to you, right? You can, you can do all that. I have a keyboard in my mouse and I, and I have a water bottle here and I'll have a handkerchief. And if I need fuel or something, I'll have that here. Usually I'll have two or three water bottles. Um, okay. It's hard to type when you're on rollers. So it's, it's kind of a process to yeah. you know, only do short clicks or short things. You know, when you're on the rollers, it's, it's, you know, concentration for the whole time. Right. Man, you're gonna you're gonna hit an aid station in your next race, and people are not gonna know what hit them. You're gonna be doing like 18 things, <laughs> one-handed. You're, you're gonna go through like I'm gonna do this one blindfolded. Here we go. I got it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, John uh, and Jess, thank you both so much for sharing the build. It's epic to see. It's for me, it's even better to hear the story and kind of how you're putting it together. Um, I definitely want to connect with you once you get outside. I know you've been doing a lot of great work on Zwift. I've been watching you grow. Um, but to have the bike that kind of fits you, I think you're going to be super pumped. Like that change in the, in the seat angle, the shorter cranks, uh, plus obviously new bike smell. Uh, but all of that adds up to just, you know, comfort equals speed as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I'll be really curious to hear about your one by experience, you know, for the rest of the people on the team who are, will obviously be leading that way in, uh, in short order. If, if the Withrow tradition continues, you innovate, we follow. Uh, I'm sure it will be there. Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about it. I. I can't wait to get outside on it. I can't wait to race on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the one by thing, I think 10 years from now, all bikes will be one by. So yeah. we'll, we can pull this up and say, oh, look at that guy way ahead of his time. Yeah. Uh, but we'll see. All right. Uh, I'm excited. Awesome. Well, thank you uh, to you, obviously, to our partners at Ventum, uh, to your friends at Zip, um, to your bike fitter. You said Chris Balzer, is that his last name? Balls, yeah. yeah awesome. Bike. I'll give him a plug as well. Um, make sure we get him in the show notes too. Um, but everyone else, if you're thinking about a bike, this is literally a step-by-step -step process of how you want to think about it, how you should think about it before you invest your money. Make sure you've got the relationships and the support and the information you need 
and put it together and you get that marriage of, of equipment uh, with fitness um, and uh, you know some good discipline, some patience as well, little, little stem cap reminding you, you're off to the races. All right, John, thank you so much, man. You enjoy the rest of your week. Great, thank you. All right, see ya.